another installment of the Kaiser Oral History Project. It's a project brought to you by the City of Kaiser, the Kaiser Points of Interest Committee, and the Kaiser Heritage Foundation. My name is Jason Cox. Today I'm here with uh, two longtime veterans of Kaiser Fire District, Mr. Dan Woolley and Mr. Jim Trett. So we're going to start right out. And uh, Dan, I understand your family had a history of uh, service in the fire service. Yeah, my father was a uh, fire chief uh, in Southern Oregon, uh, Ofer Rural Fire Protection District, and I believe they formed around 1962. And he was the first uh, first fire chief down there. So they allowed me to ride around on the tailboards of the fire truck back in those days, and, and that's how I got involved in the fire service from from back in those days. So what'd you enjoy about it? Well, I just enjoyed. Uh, of course, all kids like to play with fire trucks, and. Uh, it was something that was, uh, we didn't have too many calls down there, my dad did, and it was exciting, uh, of course, and it was all just, just fire only. And, uh, you know, getting fire apparatus, pulling hoses, and, and uh, squirting water, and uh, just a lot of fun. And Jim, how'd you get interested? I, I got involved, be, um, I was a member of the Salem Elks, and the Kaiser Elks had just formed. Um, and we'd done a visitation out here, we were at the, at the Kaiser Elks Lodge, and uh, Chief Sanford at the time, said, hey, we're going over to the fire station to finish our social visit. And so we all got on the back of the fire truck and drove over there. I thought that was pretty cool. And then uh, Dwayne figured out I lived out here, and he said, you need to be a volunteer. And uh, I was planning to move to South Salem in, uh, in about six months, and I, well, I'll do it for six months because I get to drive with the lights and sirens and all those kinds of neat things. Uh -huh. um, and uh, six months later, they called and said, You're, you can move in, in any time. I said, I think I'll stay here. I'm having fun with the fire district. So I did that. So it started kind of the same way. It's, it's a fun, neat thing to do and ended up realizing that you made an impact in your community. Well, it... <clears throat> You you almost make it you guys almost make it sound like it a fun thing you were doing. I mean it's very serious, but you were enjoying yourselves also. And this is you know I think people it's worth remembering that this was volunteer duty. So, what were you guys doing to make a living, support your families? Surveying. I was in broadcast radio at the time. Oh okay, that's a and so did you enjoy the uh, communications radio part of that especially? I, I was having a ball. I had no I, that was going to be my career choice. Um, and uh, was for a while, and then kind of went off into other areas. But uh, at the time, I had no desire to be a career firefighter or anything else. It was just, I, I felt good. In my case, I felt good because I knew I was helping people that really needed it. And, and it was a strong social network right there, too. You, we did a lot of social things and, and uh, had a lot of fun. And then Kaiser Fire has always had a history of being involved in the community, and some of those activities I... I, I was enjoying too, so the, I think that's what got under the skin and made me want to be involved. I understand Chief uh, Dwayne Sanford, he was uh, the chief at the time you guys joined, correct? Right. Yeah. Um, was the chief from uh, 1965 all the way up to 1988, you know, quite a long time. Uh, and I understand he had quite the personality as well. What What's uh, some of the... What 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 are some of your favorite uh, Chief uh, Sanford anecdotes when you get around, you know get together and talk about the old days? Well, Chief, Chief Sanford is a great guy. Uh, gosh, I don't know anybody that, that didn't like uh, Chief Sanford, but uh, he was very personable. Uh, he had a very very loud voice. Uh, he treated people very well, uh, like every everyone was his friend kind of thing. Uh, and the thing I liked about Duane is, is, is if you did something uh, wrong, uh, which we all did, obviously every now and then, if he yelled at you, uh, the next day it was forgotten kind of thing. You know, I mean, he didn't hold a grudge kind of thing. And uh, uh, he let us uh, do different things. Uh, at the time, while he was chief, uh, the fire district changed. Uh, the community was changing. And he was such a great person about community uh, support. Uh, the fire station was the hub, really, of Kaiser back in those days. And uh, we, you know, we had, he allowed us to do different functions. In other words, we had a baseball team, soft softball team. Uh, we did firemen's musters. Uh, what else did we do, Jim? Oh, just a lot of um, family-oriented kind of things. Uh, picnic was a big thing back then, so. 
The thing I always remember about Dwayne is if you wanted to know where he was, you just had to be quiet for about, or listen, and if within five minutes you'd hear a laugh. And as soon as you heard you laugh, that laugh, you knew that's where Dwayne was. And and he was, Dan's right, he was, he, if you did something wrong, he'd, he'd kind of, you know, very politely uh, let you know you'd done something wrong. It was never a, a beat you down kind of thing. It was just, you screwed up and oh, by the way, and now let's go move forward. Yeah, yeah let's move mm -hmm. forward and yeah. have some fun. So yeah. he, uh, he, it was just, you knew you messed up and you knew what to do next time and then it was over. You know, so. So you both joined in January 19, or ni the year 1974. You were January, and you were a little bit later in the year, correct? Yeah, Jim. Jim started, I think, actually a month before I did. June, I think I started, I shouldn't put words in, but June of 74, I think. Okay. I think Jim started just before I did, yeah. So that was before, um, you know, there's certainly no such thing as the building that we're filming this here today at the Kaiser Civic Center. Um, no city of Kaiser. There was a Kaiser Service District. There was the right. school, and you had Kaiser Fire Hall. Right. So, uh, tell me, let's talk a little bit more about the activities that uh, occurred in Kaiser Fire Hall and the role that it, that, that hub played in the community. Well, I, as far as uh, the way we're alerted, as far as plectrons. Well, we'll uh, get to that. Side of it, more or? of the social part. Oh, the social part of what it. What were some oh, big gosh. events that happened there? Or well, not so big events? Well, you know, we did. We had some... Uh, I think we had the well right after I joined. I think we had the last fireman's ball, so that was that was an event that that ended in about seventy four seventy five. We had uh, uh, had pancake breakfast. We had some events. The pancake breakfast, of course, still continues. We had the candy cane program. Uh, we had the sweethearts banquet, and we had. Uh, for a few years there, back in the late 70s, early 80s, we had that group from Hawaii that would come and put on a some right. Hawaiian dance uh, at the fire station there. And maybe Jim remembers better than I do how that came about. I think Dwayne or Sam Orkut or someone knew them. They were they. There was a high school group from Hawaii. They would come over and and participate. I want to almost say Rose Festival. They were involved with. Um, but then they'd come down here and they did some things at McNary. Uh, they'd do some things. We had them at the fire hall. Um, so th those kinds of things. There were several years just before Dan and I joined where they did, the fire district actually did a float in the Rose Festival parade, the Grand Floral yeah, Parade yeah. every year. Um, so we'd have the, the princesses come down. Uh, they'd show up for a day at the fire station. Um, it was just, just a lot of family stuff. Uh, Part of that was because, like we've said, it was the hub of the community, but it was also a way to keep volunteers in town. Um, I mean, if you wanted to go do much of anything food-wise or anything like that, you had to go into Salem, mm -hmm. which pulled volunteers away from here. So they did a lot down there just to keep the families close. And uh, we had big fam big picnic every summer uh, involving the staff and the whole family. So it was... Uh, some of that stuff was designed to do that, was to uh, keep the volunteers local and and something to do. But also, it always included the community, you know, bring bring those people in and and enjoy that that atmosphere also. Well, you mentioned the the candy cane tradition, where fire trucks uh, mm -hmm. go through the streets of Kaiser. I hear them on my street every year with Santa on the back handing out candy canes, and that was a well established thing by the time. You guys came, was that correct? That started about 62, 19, 62 63. Yeah. Yeah. So what's kept that going? You know, you have, you know, every, every group has traditions that mm -hmm. fall by the wayside through the years. You know, old traditions fall, new traditions come. What made this one stick? Well, I think, you know, gosh, it was something the you get out in the community like that, the kids just love to see Santa Claus. And, and we love going out uh, with Santa on the back of the fire engines and, and you, and you, go through the whole community and uh, all the kids get to meet and greet Santa Claus if they want to and Santa hands them a candy cane and and uh, it's just a, it's a great way uh, and it's a great tradition just to carry on everyone really enjoys that part of it that's a hard that's a long day mm -hmm. and uh, generally obviously in December the weather's not the greatest around here and it's a little bit demanding and uh, but basically, uh, everyone just everyone loves the kids and loves to participate in that event. 
I, I think when, when Dan and I started, we were almost done by one. We'd start at eight, yeah. and we'd be done by one. Mm -hmm. um, and then as Kaiser, of course, grew now, it's a day-long you know, event where you've really got to go. But back then, we'd, I mean, if there was a sick kid, we'd go into the bedroom and give him a candy cane. And, you know, and I think it's stuck because the community really looks at that as part of being in Kaiser. Um, one of the things that they can look forward to, I mean, we get calls at the fire station beginning in 1st December wondering when Candy Cane Day was because grandkids now live in South Salem, but grandparents want them, are going to have them over for the night so they could be there for that that candy cane when Santa goes by and, mm -hmm. and you'd have people getting ready for it, you know. And, and for us, it was always, uh, I've got some great stories about <laughs> what happens uh -huh. on Candy Cane Day. And, uh, you know, I, I remember one, I was, we were out on, on doing candy canes and I remember a, a girl, she was 23, and I remember that because of what she said. Mom's got her by the ear, pulling her out of the front door. And the girl, lady is saying, Mom, I'm 23 years old. And the lady's going, I don't care. You've had a candy cane from Santa every year since you've been six. You're going to get one this year, too. <laughs> you know, so those kinds of things, those kinds of stories, uh, uh, I remember years later. So it, I think it was, for a lot of us, it was as big a part of everything as it was for the community. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. So um, in the 70s, there was the, you still, the, you still hear the siren tested at noon every Friday. And right. in, in, in all practicality, we've sort of moved on to uh, more advanced technologies. And even then, you were, you know, the days of a siren and a phone tree were a little bit uh, past. How did you get word of, you know, being, uh, I guess, first of all, we, we're, how often were you summoned from your homes for any kind of... We had a radio, we had a, uh, called a Plectron, it's like a, it's a radio box that dispatch, uh, Salem, Salem Fire dispatched us, and uh, they, would, they send out a tone, and that sets off your Plectron, which alerts you and tells you uh, what type of fire you're having and where it's at. And uh, we use that on the fire side, uh, and then also as we... I got into the medical field and we used it for our, our medical alert to us. That's how we were alerted. But back in those days, we had the fire siren also blew. So not only did your plectron go off, but the fire siren blew also. So we had a, a dual way of alerting us. And, and uh, some, some days it'd blow. You know, obviously, if you have a call, the people got tired, I think, of hearing the fire siren go off four or five times a day back in those days. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. yeah. The plectrons, you got to remember, were a big box. Not, not big, but they were, you know, six inches long. You, you yeah. couldn't carry them around. So the, the siren was, if you were at the store or if you were out in the yard, you could hear it and know that you had to come. And uh, so that was just kind of the backup at the time. Um, it was loud. I mean, I was remember yeah. going into a meeting at South Salem High School one night, and the siren went off, and I heard it there because uh, I was, had to go back. And, yeah, we had a call right about then. So, uh, but that's what that was for us was a great backup. So, the it's interesting that we they're still called fire districts because so little of what fire districts do now, thanks largely to preventative efforts by fire departments, smoke detector laws, uh, different fire codes, building, uh, you know, you can't use some of the same materials that you used to. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, obviously, what you, the fire district does now is medical. Um, let's talk about the, first though, what were, are there any major fires that you fought that stuck out, that stick out in your mind today? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll start out, but he, he's the one. I remember back, uh, probably late 70s, if I was going to guess, I'd say 78, 79. We had an apartment fire down here uh, off 5th, off of James uh, Street. And it's probably uh, 24 to 30 apartments in that complex, I'm not sure. But the fire started downstairs, uh, and actually Jim, Jim lived there at the time in that apartment complex. So I know a lot. That was one of the biggest fires that I was on. Uh, and, uh, but Jim can tell a better story than me because he was living there at the time. What, did you <laughs> need something to do? I guess. <laughs> I, it was one of those. It, it, it happened. Uh, 
It started about 11. I About I, when I, was this? Oh, 1976 in there somewhere, I would think. I'd been on the department a couple of years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, actually started in the apartment next to mine. And uh, I heard light bulbs exploding, which I realized now at the time, I, I thought somebody was out in the parking lot dropping half-empty beer bottles because it just sounded like that. And I... In fact, I went out in the parking lot and looked. The apartment manager was in another building. He was looking. About half an hour later, I heard the sound of the fire. So we phoned that in. Um, and it was it, it actually killed my two neighbors uh, in that apartment. So um, that was undoubtedly the biggest one I was in. I, I remember um, our crews tried, it basically went started in their apartment and went up. Uh, into the second floor, and so did more damage up there than it, and I was on the first floor, uh, but did more damage up that way. But I remember there uh, running to my car to go to the station to come back to fight the fire, and I, I remember opening the door, closing the door, saying, hey, Jim, they're going to bring the fire truck to you. Um, so, But I, I remember the frustration of we attacked it, and it would pop up somewhere else. And I'm going, of all the fires we can't seem to put out real well, it... It, we did, but it was at the time. It seemed like it took forever for the crews to knock that thing down. Uh, but so that was probably my most memorable. Uh, we had a couple of big ones out at Shamali Indian School. A couple of the old dorms burned there. Um, going into downtown Salem was back up for some of those. Um, remember those, but but the most memorable one would be the the apartments that I lived in. Oh, for sure. So, how do you cope with something like that? You know, you're not. We're not talking about firefighting as an abstract concept. We're talking about your friend, you know, people you know, especially then guys are was a lot smaller and you just had the, a better chance of knowing whoever was involved. So, you know, how did the district teach you mentally to handle that stress? Well, we had, we had classes and different people would come in and if we needed that kind of thing and, and, and talk to us, uh, about about different situations and different types of things and and it was okay you know if something bothered you it was okay you know to pull somebody aside and say you know this this cult bothered me uh, maybe there was a fatality in the fire and 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 don't don't keep it inside of you you know uh, find somebody to talk to and and, uh, and kind of get it off your chest kind of thing and and uh, talk it over and and uh, and that helped. Uh, we had chaplains we could call if we needed to, also, and still, still do. Uh, but yeah, they, uh, the district made you know, things have changed, obviously, like we've talked about. But but even back in those days, uh, <clears throat> you know, we felt some relief by finding someone to to talk to and just talk things over. Yeah. You know? I think we all had our own support group. You know, mm -hmm. people that you knew you could talk to, and and uh, if if something got under your skin. Uh, and there were times where, yeah, you do the, you knew the people involved, and mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, for me, I think it was an overriding sense of, yeah, we, as long as you could look at it and say we went in and we did the best we could, and then I think we did that a lot. We could we could make that statement, yes, we did the best we could, um, and uh, so I think that that did a lot of it. Um, a lot of times, the people who were involved came back to us at the district and would say, thank you for what you did do. We really appreciated. I think that made things easier at times. So sure. So and we talked a little bit about how the transition started, um, or just that the transition happened. How did that? Was there anything in particular that started um, the, the, this slow transition from pretty much exclusively fighting fires? And uh, you know, I, I know I've seen things like flood, you know, pumping out a flooded basement or something like that. To what? What is it? Ninety-seven percent of the calls now are medical. You know, I, I may not, I don't quote that statistic, but I know that it's yeah. very, very, very high. How did that transition start? Well, it was like we talked about, like we all, we all talk about is when, that, when the TV series Emergency did come on TV, where Johnny Gage and Roy DeSoto were on Squad 51, responding to not only fire calls, but responding to, uh, to medical calls, that truly did change the fire service. So then the public really demanded that we not only do do the fire side of it, but we need to be trained in EMS because they were calling us on heart attacks, uh, traffic accidents, uh, 
uh, different times of, of medical calls, and we had to get the training to, you know, to answer those calls. And we became EMTs in 74, 75. And, uh, and like I said, not, not necessarily because we wanted to, because that's where the fire service was headed. We were headed toward the medical uh, EMS side of it also. Mm -hmm. And we just accepted those duties and, and uh, we became EMTs and started duty shifts, yeah. Our, we had a, a, a volunteer at the time, Bob Wickman, who later served on the board, great guy, but he was, uh, he was heavily involved in the medical side of, of things and wanted, wanted us to do it. I remember Chief Sanford at one point saying, we're a fire department, we'll put a Band-Aid on a cut in a car accident, but that's going to be it. <laughs> and then, as Dan oh. said, the emergency, the emergency TV show came on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and six months later, we were ordering our first rig. Uh, once again, that was Dwayne. You know, we're not going to do that. Well, yes, we are, because that's what the community wants. So once again, he responded to what the community wanted. Um, I don't know. Don't think he ever really intended or wanted to go there himself, but but did and supported it. I mean, it, it wasn't half-hearted support. It was once we went there, he was he really supported it. So, did you find that as enjoyable as the fire side? I, I uh, not not as enjoyable. No, I've I've, I've liked the fire side of it more. Uh, I enjoyed everything about the fire department, though. But but uh, I'd rather. Just do the fire side of it only, though. No, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, I mean, who, you don't like uh, some some of the medical calls you go on. Uh, you know, they're not they're not as pleasant as as uh, one might think or whatever. But I like the fire side of it a lot better. You know, Dwayne was very good about. of the Kaiser Oral History Project. It's a project brought to you by the City of Kaiser, the Kaiser Points of Interest Committee, and the Kaiser Heritage Foundation. My name is Jason Cox. Today I'm here with uh, two longtime veterans of Kaiser Fire District, Mr. Dan Woolley and Mr. Jim Trett. So we're going to start right out. And uh, Dan, I understand your family had a history of uh, service in the fire service. Yeah, my father was a uh, fire chief uh, in Southern Oregon, uh, Ophir Rural Fire Protection District. And I believe they formed around 1962, and he was the first uh, first fire chief down there. So they had allowed me to ride around on the tailboards of the fire truck back in those days, and, and that's how I got involved in the fire service from, from back in those days. So what did you enjoy about it? Well, I just enjoyed, uh, of course, all kids like to play with fire trucks. And... Uh, it was something that was, uh, we didn't have too many calls down there. My dad did, and it was exciting, uh, of course, and it was all just, just fire only. And, uh, you know, getting fire apparatus, pulling hoses, and, and uh, squirting water, and uh, just a lot of fun. And, Jim, how did you get interested? I, I got involved. Be, um, I was a member of the Salem Elks, and the Kaiser Elks had just formed. Um, and we'd done a visitation out here. We were at the, at the Kaiser Elks Lodge, and uh, Chief Sanford at the time, said, hey, we're going over to the fire station to finish our social visit. And so we all got on the back of the fire truck and drove over there. I thought that was pretty cool. And then uh, Dwayne figured out I lived out here, and he said, you need to be a volunteer. And uh, I was planning to move to South Salem on a, in about six months, and I, well, I'll do it for six months because I get to drive with the lights and sirens and all those kinds of neat things. Uh -huh. um, and uh, six months later, they called and said, You're, you can move in, in any time. I said, I think I'll stay here. I'm having fun with the fire district. So it did that. So it started kind of the same way. It's, it's a fun, neat thing to do and ended up realizing that you made an impact in your community. Well, it, <clears throat> you, you almost make it, you guys almost make it sound like it, a fun thing you were doing. I mean, it's very serious, but you were enjoying yourselves also. And this is, you know, I think people, it's worth remembering that this was volunteer duty. So what were you guys doing to make a living, support your families? Surveying. I was in broadcast radio at the time. So. Oh, okay. That's a, and so did you enjoy the uh, communications radio part of that, especially? I, I was having a ball. I had no, I, that was going to be my career choice. Um, and uh, was for a while, and then kind of went off into other areas. But uh, at the time, I had no 
desire to be a career firefighter or anything else. It was just, I, I felt good. In my case, I felt good because I knew I was helping people that really needed it. And, and it was a strong social network right there, too. You, we did a lot of social things and, and uh, had a lot of fun. And then Kaiser Fire has always had a history of being involved in the community, and some of those activities I, I, I was enjoying, too. So the, I think that's what got under the skin and made me want to be involved. I understand Chief uh, Dwayne Sanford, he was uh, the chief at the time you guys joined, correct? Right. Yeah. Um, was the chief from uh, 1965 all the way up to 1988, you know, quite a long time. Uh, and I understand he had quite the personality as well. What, what's uh, some of the, what, what, what are some of your favorite uh, Chief uh, Sanford anecdotes when you get, around, you know, get together and talk about the old days? Well, Chief, Chief Sanford was a great guy, uh, gosh. I don't know anybody that, that didn't like uh, Chief Sanford, but uh, he was very personable. Uh, he had a very, very loud voice. Uh, he treated people very well, uh, like every, everyone was his friend kind of thing. Uh, and the thing I liked about Dwayne is, is, is if you did something uh, wrong, uh, which we all did, obviously every now and then, if he yelled at you, uh, the next day it was forgotten kind of thing, you know, I mean, he didn't hold a grudge kind of thing, and uh, uh, he let us uh, do different things. Uh, at the time, while he was chief, uh, the fire district changed, uh, the community was changing, and he was such a great person about community uh, support. Uh, the fire station was the hub, really, of Kaiser back in those days. and. Uh, we, you know, we had, he allowed us to do different functions. In other words, we had a baseball team, soft softball team. Uh, we did fireman's musters. Uh, what else did we do, Jim? Oh, just a lot of um, family-oriented kind of things. Uh, picnic was a big thing back then. So I used thing I always remember about Dwayne is if you wanted to know where he was, you just had to be quiet for about, listen, and if within five minutes you'd hear a laugh. And as soon as you heard you laugh, that laugh, you knew that's where Dwayne was. And, and he was, Dan's right, he was, if you did something wrong, he'd, he'd kind of, you know, very politely uh, let you know you'd done something wrong. It was never a, a beat you down kind of thing. It was just, you screwed up and, oh, by the way, and now let's go move forward yeah, yeah let's move mm -hmm. forward and yeah. have some fun so yeah. he uh it was just you knew you messed up and you knew <laughs> what to do the next time and then it was over you know, so. so you both joined in january 19 or night the year 1974 you were january and you were a little bit later in the year correct yeah jim jim started i think actually a month before i did june i think i started i shouldn't put words but june of 74 i think okay I think jim started just before i did yeah so that was before, um, you know, there's certainly no such thing as the building that we're filming this here today at the Kaiser Civic Center. Um, no city of Kaiser. There was a Kaiser Service District. There was the right. school, and you had the Kaiser Fire Hall. Right. So uh, tell me, let's talk a little bit more about the activities that uh, occurred in Kaiser Fire Hall and the role that, it, that that hub played in the community. Well, as far as... Uh the way we're alerted as far as plectrons. Well, we'll uh, get to that. Of it, More of the social part. Oh, the social part of what it. What were some oh, big gosh. events that happened there? Or well, not so big events? Well, you know, we did. We had some, uh, I think we had the, well, right after I joined, I think we had the last fireman's ball. So that was that was an event that, that ended in about 74, 75. We had, uh, uh, we had pancake breakfast. We had some events. The pancake breakfast, of course, still continues. We had the candy cane program. Uh, we had the sweethearts banquet, and we had uh, for a few years there, back in the late 70s, early 80s, we had that group from Hawaii that would come and put on a some right. Hawaiian dance uh, at the fire station there. And maybe Jim remembers better than I do how that came about. I think Dwayne or Sam Orkut or someone knew them. They were they there was a high school group from Hawaii. They would come over and, and participate. I want to almost say Rose Festival they were involved with. Um but then they'd come down here and they did some things at McNary. Uh, they'd do some things. We had them at the fire hall. Um so those kinds of things. There were several years just before Dan and I joined where they did the fire district actually did a float in the Rose Festival parade. 
the Grand Floral Parade every yeah. year. Um, so we'd have the, the princesses come down. Uh, they'd show up for a day at the fire station. Um, it was just just a lot of family stuff. Uh, <clears throat> part of that was because, like we've said, it was the hub of the community, but it was also a way to keep volunteers in town. Um, I mean, if you wanted to go do much of anything food-wise or anything like that, you had to go into Salem, mm -hmm. which pulled volunteers away from here. So they did a lot down there just to keep the families close. And uh, we had big fam big picnic every summer uh, involving the staff and the whole family. So it was, uh, some of that stuff was designed to do that, was to uh, keep the volunteers local and and something to do, but also it always included the community. You know, bring bring those people in and and enjoy that that atmosphere also. Well, you mentioned the, the candy cane tradition where fire trucks uh, mm -hmm. go through the streets of Kaiser. I hear them on my street every year with Santa on the back handing out candy canes, and that was a well-established thing by the time you guys came. Was that correct? That started about 62, 19, 62 63. Yeah. Yeah. So what's kept that going? You know, you have, you know, every, every group has traditions that mm -hmm. fall by the wayside through the years. You know, old traditions fall, new traditions come. What made this one stick? Well, I think, you know, gosh, it was something the you get out in the community like that, the kids just love to see Santa Claus. And and we love going out uh, with Santa on the back of the fire engines and, and, you, and you go through the whole community and uh, all the kids get to meet and greet Santa Claus if they want to and Santa hands them a candy cane and and uh, it's just a, it's a great way uh, and it's a great tradition just to carry on. Everyone really enjoys that part of it. That's a hard, that's a long day. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally, obviously, in December, the weather's not the greatest around here. And it's a little bit demanding. And uh, but basically, uh, everyone just, everyone loves the kids and loves to participate in that event. I, I think when, when Dan and I started, we were almost done by one. We'd start at eight. Yeah. And we'd be done by one. Mm -hmm. um, and then as Kaiser, of course, grew now, it's a day-long, you know, event where you've really got to go. But back then, we'd, I mean, if there was a sick kid, we'd go into the bedroom and give him a candy cane. And, you know, and, uh, I think it's stuck because the community really looks at that as part of being in Kaiser. Um, one of the things that they can look forward to, I mean, we get calls at the fire station beginning in 1st December wondering when Candy Cane Day was because grandkids now live in South Salem, but grandparents want them, are going to have them over for the night so they could be there for that that Candy Cane when Santa goes by, and, mm -hmm. and you'd have people getting ready for it, you know. And, and for us, it was always, uh, I've got some great stories about <laughs> what happens uh -huh. on Candy Cane Day. And, uh, you know, I, I remember one, I was... We were out on on doing candy canes, and I remember a, a girl. She was 23, and I remember that because of what she said. Mom's got her by the ear, pulling her out of the front door. He really did want to get in the EMS thing, uh, but yet, like I said, he did have an open mind. So we, you know, and he knew where we were headed, uh, the public demand and stuff. So in 1979, I think I think it's when we got our first rescue, which is Rescue 353. Uh, was in 1979, I believe, and then uh, he threw his support in on that, and and we we got the equipment to to respond in it. Yeah, how about you, Jim? Yeah. Kind of the same way. I mean, I I, I did enjoy the medical side. I um, when I was growing up, actually, that at one point, Dr. Cashline, who was the doctor in town at the time, was convinced I was going to be a doctor. So I I had a kind of an inkling towards that and uh, but that's where I but I really enjoyed both sides um, fire and the medical so Jim I understand that uh, you worked quite a bit with the schools as a education officer type position yeah uh, talk a little bit about your work there um, actually I replaced a guy that actually started that Bill Holmstrom was the first pub ed public information guy um, I did some public information before that. It was once again, Dwayne, you're in radio, you, you know how to do that. 
no, I didn't, but we made it work. But then they, they hired Bill as a deputy fire marshal and then made him pub ed, uh, public information because there was a move in the fire service towards that. And then I took it over in 1995. Um, and, and basically we became part of the, for several years, I had a mailbox at Whitaker Middle School. Uh, so at one point the assistant principal said, you need a key, because we were up there just about every day. Uh, we did a lot in the grade schools, but we were a natural fit for, for health classes uh, in the sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Uh, so we did a lot there, and then a little bit at the high school, and a lot of community outreach, open houses, two open houses a year. Um, and things like that. So heavily involved in, in things like that. And, and, and that was uh, a great part of my job. I really enjoyed that, I, interacting with the kids. I uh, grew up in the Y doing camp counseling, things like that. So I had worked with kids a lot. And so this was just an extension of two things I got to do that I really loved. So what would the transition, uh, Chief Sanford retired in 1988, 89, in the late 80s, and uh, briefly there was a chief that uh, came in from Fairbanks, Alaska, and his name was um, Barry, Barry Jennings. Jennings. And uh, so what was it that, um, you know, it sounds like he was, you know, a good professional, but what was it that, what was the, what, what was wrong with the fit in Kaiser? I, I think part of the problem was he followed Dwayne Sanford. Dwayne had that personality where you just kind of liked him. Uh, he, you know, he stuck his hand out in a hurry. He'd, he'd laugh and joke with you. And Barry was more of a, of a laid-back professional, if you will. Uh, not that Dwayne wasn't, but he, he, Barry exuded that I'm a professional kind of thing. I'm not going to get too close. I think that's when it was my perception, anyway. Yeah, and just yeah, just wasn't as community oriented. Uh, just wasn't. Uh, as close to the guys, uh, didn't did, just didn't fit in like Dwayne. Uh, but like he said, he had big shoes to fill because Dwayne, uh, we all loved Dwayne, and so he had big shoes to fill, and and uh, he just couldn't fill those shoes. And and uh, he was a fire chief for just a little less than a year. So that led to uh, Greg Frank becoming chief. And how how do you? Th and he'd been a volunteer for quite some time, I believe. Correct. Right. That was one of the things that, to Greg's favor was is yeah he started out as a as a volunteer, uh, worked his way through the ranks, and uh, Greg's a personal guy. Of course, knows the community, especially running the the store there. He got to know everybody, uh, and uh, Greg Greg did a much better job of 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 uh, filling the shoes that that Dwayne left behind uh, when he retired and then that's when we really started getting into the medical field is after it's because uh, uh, the community again we were starting to to get three or four calls maybe a day uh, whatever uh, and like you said 90 you know 85 90 percent of them was EMS calls uh, and Greg had to deal with that and did a good job dealing with that what did you think but part of the transition, I think, was because we were serviced by a private ambulance service. Well, I'm an ambulance, and Salem decided they were going to Salem Fire decided they were going to get into the medical field, and that kind of I think forced us a little bit to get into it, mm -hmm. into the transport business because mm -hmm. all of a sudden the private went away. Um, but yeah, Greg and Greg handled that well. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he was not quite as gregarious as Dwayne, but he was there for you. You knew he cared, uh, and he, you knew he'd, he'd back you up. Uh, and so he made that transition, I think, a lot easier. And so Greg was fire chief for, I believe, about 17, 17 years. 17 years. And yeah. he retired and is still running uh, Ace Hardware, and now we have Chief Jeff Callen there. And he believe I, I believe he joined in early 08, late 2007 in that time period. So let's let's jump back all the way to the beginning of uh, getting towards the end. Let's jump all the way back to the beginning. <laughs> engine one, uh, the very first engine Kaiser had. Uh, how did do you happen to know how it left the custody of the district? And I know you know how you got it back. We we sold it to an agency, and I can't remember that the agency in Southern Oregon is a fire truck. And then they sold it to a lumber company in Eastern Oregon as their fire. Sumter, Oregon, yeah. Sumter, yeah. Sumter, yeah. As their fire rig, and that's where some, some of our volunteers yeah. were out there hunting, is my understanding, and saw it, 
and one of the guys knew the engine and said that's ours and they came back and did some some looking around and sure enough it was so they went out and bought it they'd bought that engine i can't remember what year they'd bought it the logging operation they'd, and they'd let it set outside and the pump froze and cracked the pump so then it really wasn't being used anymore and uh so we, we bought it back and then reconditioned it. And that's used today for, uh, what, what did you, well, you tell me, what did you use it for? Parades. Parades, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. And you said, must, did you, was there some mustering with it as well? We did some mustering, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was talking, we were talking earlier about the mustering, and, and the, the, actually the muster truck that we used was a 1929 purse that we had. Uh, that was uh, we bought from Silverton Fire District back many years ago, and we end up selling that back to Silverton Fire District, uh, you know, 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, this actually the engine one that we have now we actually really didn't use in our mustering part of it. We just used it in our parades. Yeah. Why was it important to bring that back? Well, you know, it's your original piece of apparatus, and it's kind of neat to have that. Uh, if you can keep that in your in your engine house, it's for the historical part of it. Uh, it's, it's part of our history and uh, it's nice to be able to keep it, you know, keep it at the station. Um, and in, particularly in your role working, uh, having worked with children, what did they think when they saw, you know, this big long fire engine with the ladder next to, uh, you know, sort of a piece of history there? Engine, well, I think it was just, it was an old fire truck and they really liked it. Uh, you know, uh, Actually, we kept them off that more than we did off our big ones. Yeah. <laughs> you know, don't touch it, you'll scratch your paint. I mean, they, they literally took that down to nuts and bolts to restore it and, yeah. and, and did it all the way back up. Uh, so we wouldn't let kids climb on that as much as we would on, on, one, on the new apparatus. Sure, climb all over that. The old one, <laughs> don't touch it, you might scratch it. So. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for joining us. also like to thank the City of Kaiser and Kaiser 23 for having us here. Um, again, this is a project, uh, uh, the oral history uh, through the Kaiser Heritage Foundation and the Kaiser Points of Interest Committee as well. Um, you can see this one on Kaiser 23, and you can see some of our past work at kaisertv.com. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.